Hello everybody, my name is Peter Klepper from the School of Biosciences at the University of Kent in Canterbury and in this video clip I want to talk a little bit about enzymes, how they have been discovered, what interesting discoveries happened over the last 200 years and also about the future of this really interesting and exciting topic. Now, enzymes have been used for thousands and thousands of years, for example, making bread, making cheese, making alcoholic drinks, involved in fermentation, which is important to preserve uh, food. Uh, for example, uh, sauerkraut, a very German um, food, is fermented cabbage. And uh, humans have used these things for, for many years. But we always used whole organisms, either yeast or microorganisms. So fermentation was done through whole organisms. Until in uh, 1878, uh, a German guy called Kühne uh, had a really crazy idea. So what he did was he killed the yeast and he opened the cells, uh, pressed them open and got an, an extract from these yeast cells. The important thing was these cells were no longer alive. They were dead and he got this extract. But what he saw is that this extract still could fulfill the function of the whole organism. Now imagine this is something absolutely incredible and it was really uh, hotly contested at that time because so far people believe that in order to do fermentation to achieve a biochemical reaction that happens in fermentation you would need a living organism. And now this Kühne person comes along and shows actually you don't need living organisms. All you need is uh, the stuff, the, the not living uh, material from the cells. And these, this, this, this uh, juice from the cells, from the dead cells, can still do fermentation. Now that was an absolutely I would almost say heresy at that time and uh, he got a lot of stick for that because nobody believed him but when they repeated these experiments that he did and where he showed that this is possible uh, people were really excited about it. Shortly after Kühne discovered uh, this remarkable uh, property of yeast that you don't need live cells uh, people started to look at what is going on in this in this extract. And in 1894, uh, a guy called Fischer, another German, proposed this lock and key model where we have the active site acting like a, a lock and the substrate slotting in like a key. In 1926, uh, a guy called Sumner crystallized the first enzyme. And again, it's very important to realize that this is something absolutely exciting and, and absolutely novel. Because so far we believed that to do biochemical reactions you needed something that is, well, not terribly well defined. It's, uh, you know, there's lots of stuff in this extract. But now you have a crystal. It is almost like a stone, like, like something inanimate, something like not alive. But it can do things. It can catalyze biochemical reactions. And that was really another heresy. How can a crystal do this stuff? But he managed to crystallize an enzyme called urease. Uh, then came the war and not a lot happened in this area, but in 1958 uh, a person called Koshland produced this induced fit model and I've shown you an example of this induced fit model that when a substrate comes along the active side changes its shape depending on the substrate and the, the substrate can 
then bind to the active site, so it induces the right fit. In 1960, uh, the first amino acid sequence of an enzyme was published. So we knew that um, an enzyme usually is made up of amino acids, it is a protein, but exactly what is the order of the amino acids in this protein was not known. So uh, they managed to sequence the the first enzyme, in this case ribonuclease, it has about 140 amino acids. And it was a very, very laborious process to get the exact sequence, but people managed to get this. In 1965, uh, that was only, you know, 50 years ago, really. In 1965, the first three-dimensional structure of an enzyme, of this lysozyme, uh, was obtained and people did X-ray crystallography. So they made a crystal of this lysozyme and bombarded it with, with X-rays. And from the way these X-rays were diffracted and uh, reflected, they could conclude on where the uh, atoms in this lysozyme are sitting. And uh, I think, again, that was uh, something very, very exciting and interesting. How does the structure, how does the, the, the correct native structure of this enzyme actually look like? Uh, and this was the first time that we, we've seen that. In 1969, again, another bit of heresy happened because what people did was they just simply took the individual amino acids uh, of an, uh, an enzyme. And again, it was the ribonuclease that was uh, sequenced in 1960. So they took these amino acids and put them together. So it was chemically synthesized. Now, again, please understand the significance of this, um, this, this, this discovery. What happened in this case was that dead stuff, dead amino acids that you can buy in the shop or so, were just simply put together and it will give something that has biological activity, that does something that catalyzes a biochemical reaction. This was absolutely wow. You make something that has the function of a, 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 something alive from something dead. Absolutely fascinating and uh, people couldn't believe that. There were then more exciting things going on. For example, in 1983, uh, a guy discovered that heat stable enzymes are very useful for um, amplifying DNA. So they looked at the thermal stability of uh, proteins, of enzymes, and they came across these extremophiles, these thermophilic organisms. And as we said uh, in, this, in this video, we said a thermophilic organism has to have all its enzymes adapted to the high temperature. And this guy, the, he had a fantastic idea. What you can do is you can actually do something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where you can amplify uh, lots and lots of DNA from a given template. And this was really the start of the biotechnological um, uh, revolution, where we now can take just simply take a little bit of DNA from whatever organism, we can amplify this uh, DNA, and we can put it then into another organism and let, for example, a protein pro uh, be produced. So again, this was absolutely fantastic discovery. In 1986, again, there was another milestone in enzymology because up until then, people believed that only proteins can fulfill an enzymatic function. But now, uh, Thomas Check demonstrated that even RNA can have an enzymatic, a catalytic function. And again, that is something absolutely amazing. Uh, something that completely changed the view how we see enzymes. But it even gets better. In 2020, so several years ago, the first commercial 
Apsyme against prostate cancer was developed. What is an apsyme? An apsyme is an enzyme that is combined with an antibody. So the antibody can bind to the cancer cell and the enzyme attached to this antibody will then destroy the cancer cell. Uh, again, a, a remarkable discovery that you can do that. So since then, cancer is not really a big issue. In 2028, uh, um, there used to be a, a horrible disease, disease of the immune system called HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, but we learned how to overcome this virus, how to combat this virus, how to uh, attack this virus. And this is called uh, with a technology, uh, or this is done with a technology called RNAi, RNA interference, where enzymes made up of of proteins and RNA are actually destroying the RNA of this HIV virus and in the in the 19 in the eight, in the 20th century um, HIV was a massive massive problem especially in Africa it is it was sexually transmitted uh, but now with this RNAi technology it has been completely eradicated in 2032, the first photosynthetic power plant opened in, uh, U uh, in the US and this photosynthetic power plant actually harnessed the energy of the sun. So we completely understood how leaves are getting their energy from the sun and we can now mimic that with enzymes. And these enzymes are now producing the energy for us. Our ancestors used petrol uh, to, um, to produce energy for heating and for driving. And you can imagine it was, uh, it was a terrible mess and uh, it was horrible. It stank and, and we used valuable resources. But now with these photosynthetic power plants, we use the energy of the sun and we can make a very clean energy. In 2044, uh, a new branch uh, had been of biology had been uh, developed. It's called uh, systems biology and synthetic biology. And we learned how to manipulate organisms. So, uh, and that was done in the 20th century uh, early on. But what we now can do is we can create new organisms by putting in new biochemical pathways in them. So there are organisms now around and you can buy them uh, that can do things that naturally evolved organisms would not be able to do. So again, it's, it's a major breakthrough and in a way we, we play evolution. We now synthesize organisms. We can make organisms ourselves. A year later, a Saturn rocket was launched uh, with Photosystem II enzymes, and this was uh, shot to, to Mars. And Photosystem II, uh, this is the enzyme system in leaves that produces oxygen, oxygen from water. It is the water splitting enzyme. But why, now we can, we can manage these enzymes and uh, we can basically generate oxygen. And as you probably know, Mars contains a lot of water, but it didn't contain a lot of oxygen. So by sending this rocket to Mars, we were able to create an oxygen atmosphere and uh, it took nine more years for the oxygen level on Mars to reach reasonable levels. And in 2065, just two years ago, uh, the first permanent settlement on Mars uh, that now had enough oxygen for, uh, celebrated its fifth anniversary. So we have with the help of enzymes, we have conquered the solar system. And our next aim will be Europa, the moon around Jupiter, because we believe that from the, from the geological structure of Europa, of this moon, there might be novel life forms. We didn't find them on Mars, but we can 
probably assume that Europa has the right conditions. It has a liquid water there and uh, although it's very cold, we know that enzymes can work in the cold. So Europa might be the next big target where we find life that is not, has not been generated or produced on Earth or on Mars. How exciting is enzymology? Thank you for watching and I hope this makes sense. Now, if you think that I'm completely mad telling you all about these projects in the future, obviously it is in the future. If you think that it's not going to happen and I'm mad, well, think again. All these projects are currently worked on in laboratories across the world. Artificial organisms, RNAi, apsymes, working on photosyn uh, photosynthesis and plans to build settlements uh, not on Earth. This is all currently going on. And in order to achieve that, we need to understand enzymes and enzymology. So these are really exciting times. And I think the most important and exciting thing is that you can be part of these future developments. Thank you very much for watching.